Hello everyone and welcome to today's match in Division B between Arrogant Nephilim and Unemployed Gaming. I'm Dead Latin here with Monkus. How are you doing tonight, Monkus? I'm doing great. I am excited for this Division B West game that we are about to see. Yeah, already the team's uh, getting prepared to start the game as we look to the maps. Uh, Unemployed Gaming won the coin toss and decided to take first pick in the first game. Air Unemployed ended up banning Dragon Share and Cursed Hollow. Meanwhile, Arrogant Nephilim banned out Braxis Hollow and Altrak Pass, picking Infernal Shrines for game number one. Yeah, Infernal Shrines is a map where the rotation mid bot is very important. Mid lane or the off lane isn't as important as say on Braxis or Dragonshire, but you still don't want to lose it. Uh, the most important thing I think here is getting good shrine clear and getting good wave clear. Yeah, especially because this is one where your carry can kind of shine on if you put them, or at least your mage player can, as if you. Uh, your mage player is not only able to make a huge difference in team fights in the limited space that the objective is generally in, but also just in being able to put out a ton of clear on the objective to take it quickly after a team fight victory. Right. Expect to see uh, Kael'thas highly contested, Anna probably still up there, Diablo definitely. This is one of his best maps. He's got a lot of ways to get slams, wall slams, and resets. Also be looking to see how the main tanks are positioning just to see how they're trying to zone out for the objective. And also, of course, uh, the all valuable siege camps uh, throughout the map in the Bruiser Cape in the top lane. Uh, that could really provide an advantage early game for whichever team capitalizes on them. And keep in mind, those goat camps have been buffed, so they are stronger than ever right now. We will be getting right into the draft now. First, ban already over to Unemployed Gaming. Uh, what do you think we can expect ban-wise early on in this game, Monkus? Well, they've got first pick, so they've got to decide whether they want to prioritize their tank or their mage. Like I said, Kael'thas is really, really strong on this map, so they might want to, say, ban Anubarak, Diablo, ETC, Ayana, something that they aren't going to take with their first pick. Yeah, Anubrak has kind of been stuck in ban hell recently. He has a 100% participation rate at pretty much every division. And when he's let through, he's been dominant, but very few teams let him pass even the first bans, as Kael'thas will actually be the first ban out from unemployment to gaming. That tells me that they probably want to secure either their healer, like, say, Anna, uh, Taronda, or their tank, ETC, uh, Anubarak, or Diablo. Or maybe they prefer Jaina. Otherwise, they don't want to deal with Galfos right now. Yeah, someone who could be very contested in the draft also is Sylvanas, who has been played by both teams already, but is just going to be banned out from Arrogant Nephilim, making sure Unemployed doesn't pick it up with that first pick. Yeah, Sylvanas causes a lot of snowballing on this map. You get control of the objective, you get Sylvanas pushing with it, and can easily turn something that would have gotten maybe a few towers to something that gets down to four. Well, Ana going to be the ban, as you're saying, make sure to try to get uh, Ana, especially if you, uh, she pairs very well with a mage uh, when you are able to take that nano boost. Right, and now it's an interesting position for Arrogant Nephilim. They can, say, ban no tanks here, and they get Diablo, Anubrak, ETC, basically whatever Unemployed Gaming doesn't take. Kel'Thuzad now going to be denied away as well. Uh, so I expect maybe like a Jaina here, as or also Gul'dan still left on the board as another mage option if they want to go that early on. Yeah, there are still enough mages open right now that I don't know if it's necessarily the hottest thing to get in this spot. Uh, unless it's a particular comfort pick, like you really do better on Jaina. There's the Taronda. Yeah, Taronda gonna get not only a ton of value out of Starfall, uh, able to just plop it on the objective, get some passive minions taken, and also a ton of damage, but also uh, it kind of might show uh, some a potential dive maybe, uh, or and just Tronda's good at initiating fights. Meanwhile, Stukov going to be the response from Arrogant Nephilim. Stukov, very strong point control, 
Trabe is very, very well versed on Jaina, so that's a easy pickup for them to make sure they secure that. And the Taronda pickup, uh, she's really good at those combo stuns. Like you get Diablo, ETC, Anubarak to land their stun, then she follows up, and you can just carry that chain stun until somebody's dead. Yeah, and now perhaps look to see a main tank option coming in here before the bands as it will be the ETC along with Orphea. So a very aggressive uh, picks coming in so far from Unemployed. Orphea is interesting because she doesn't necessarily have the same wave clear that Jaina or Chaos or Dan does. She's a little bit slower, uh, has to get in a little bit closer to really get her damage in. She really fits in well with a dive comp, which ETC and Toronto do facilitate. Meanwhile, Dahaka is going to be denied away. Uh, very strong on Infernal, not only with his AoE damage to help with adding some clear to your team, but also uh, tons of bushes on the map for him to teleport to. Right, Dahaka, he, his value comes in from very suddenly appearing, getting his stun off, and getting that quick pick. And sometimes you just don't want to deal with that global. You want to make sure that you are safe whenever you're doing your rotations. Well, Johanna going to be denied out. A very strong main tank. Uh, especially if you are... Uh, she does do a good job at appealing off uh, if you are trying to go more deny. Especially uh, trying to peel off Rexbud diving in deep. Uh, right, Janet works really well with the backline comp. Like, in which with Jaina and Rainer, that's kind of what they have right here. She gives a good wall of protection and keeps the dive from going too far in. Well, Murden actually going to be the main tank pick from Arrogant Nephilim. Uh, doesn't see as much play nowadays, but uh, will be valuable in getting the initial uh, initial uh, team fight. I, I'm forgetting the word. Initialization. Like, start starting out the fight for Nephilim. Yes, initiation. He, he's got decent peel. Sometimes you see people going Uther main take instead of Muradin because of the targeted stun. Imperius and Hanzo. Hanzo, that's where their big wave player is going to come in from. From Hanzo with his Q build here. Or not Q build. Scatter arrow plus the Q at four is probably what we're going to see from Hanzo. It's really easy to get scatter arrow stacks here. It's really easy to get value from your Q explosions. Well... So, Kind of interesting, though, he's not necessarily a dive, and there's the Zagara. Mig plays a very strong Zagara that will give constant macro pressure. They're not necessarily playing to win the objective. They want to at least delay it and let Zagara create pressure. One thing to note, though, is Anubarak actually made it through that draft completely through both teams not wanting to go for him. I think that's partially just because Nephilim wanted to try to get more peel rather than Anubarak, as Anubarak's a more aggressive tank, but still, surprised to see him make it through. Right. Anubarak and Diablo. Uh, the meta is, like, shifting a little bit. ETC provides a little bit more protection. Diablo is much more aggressive, especially in these type of comps. And, yeah, Arrogant Nephilim drafted a backline comp, and so they kind of don't want to be going all in. They might have chosen, say, a Garrosh to really give them extra protection and throw people away, set up picks for when they needed it, isolate it. But Murden can still get the job done. Yeah, it should be interesting to see if Rexpo is going to get a ton of value off the Orphea. Definitely look to see his timing and when to initialize go in and try to finish off the backline of Nephilim. And also look and see how much value Mig's going to be able to get on the Zagara. Yeah, the things I think you want to look out for is Taronda landing her combos with ETC and how well can Orphea carry. Here we go for game number one, Arrogant Nephilim. It's going to be Trape on the Jaina, No Pointer on the Stukov, Knight on the Rainer, Antaeus on the Muradin, and Mig on the Zagara. And for Unemployed Gaming, we have Nathan on Hanzo, Rexpa on Orphea, Pimor on Taronda, Crafty on ETC, and Bridge to Death on Imperius. Unemployed going to start all five in the mid. Meanwhile, Mig immediately going to be peeling off to the top lane in order to get the creep started, as well as uh, potent, uh, make sure that the top wave gets cleared pretty quickly to force the rotation up 
from Bridge to Death. Interesting talent choice pickup. Antaeus decided to go with Perfect Storm on Muradin. Uh, that gives him a little bit less uh, sustain in the long team fights on the point, but it gives him a lot more damage. And that, and they really want to set up picks here when they can. Alrighty, an aggressive slide in there from Crafty, looking to burst down Antaeus, actually. Nice follow up from Pimor, but not able to find the damage this early on to uh, successfully burst Antaeus down. Well, that was all just distracting, trying to keep their attention while Mig got what work he could get done top. That's already probably 80% of one tower gone. And meanwhile, in the bot lane, Unemployed has been very aggressive so far on the rotations, just looking to get as much pressure on the Nephilim as they can, but Nephilim's just been able to absorb it and get their rotations going. And see, one strength that Eric and Nephilim had here was that they had the last pick Zagara, which you really want to counter Zagara by rotating onto her. Uh, oh, it looks like the game isn't showing up on the screen. Uh, both teams taking their camp early. Nephilim just now picking it up. Meanwhile, uh, Unemployed just now finishing with their siege camp. And so the team's going to be starting out mid now. Uh, Nephilim, if they're able to uh, get even a tower down this mid lane, will give them a nice early siege advantage. Uh, yes, but it looks like right now the stream is showing up on, uh, on Twitch. They're just hearing us. They're not seeing anything. Ah, uh, I see why. Now we should be good to go. Uh, as in the top lane, Bridge actually going to be able to get the pick onto Mig. Interesting that he was able to do that. Usually you need to get somebody to rotate in because Zagara is just so slippery. But, and it's hard to counter Zagara when you're not prepared to in the draft. Rexpa being very aggressive onto Teus, but again, not able to find the damage yet. And the, the rotations right now looking pretty strong from both teams. A little bit of an XP advantage from Unemployed Gaming, but that's probably just because of the kill on Mig and the way that he missed. Meanwhile, they're going to be going in on mid, looking to get the pick on tonight. Rexbot going off the damage will be able to wow. confirm the kill with the chomp. That's pretty big the, with the shrine coming up right, right away. Arrogant Nephilim probably just won. Cut their losses right now, maybe go take some camps, because they can't really contest 4v5 right now. And Knight is already back up, but he's going... But Unemployed Gaming decided to go for the Thruser camp instead of getting the early Shrine League, so this is going to give Arrogant Nephilim a chance to even things out. I think this is a bit of a mistake going for the Bruiser camp that late. Already, Arrogant Nephilim has a 12 minion lead when they were up 5-4. to four. Not only that, but you had to have the uh, more, or uh, Rexpa and Pimor have to back, actually, in order to get mana back up, so they're just now getting into the fight. But in comes the engage onto a Murden, who will end up going down. A nice silence from No Pointer, not able to save Murden, however. A knight trying to get it, go in and get the damage onto Rexpa and Bridge, but not, not able to quite find it as already a one for none trade on the side of Unemployed Gaming. Right, but they, all they need is seven more uh, monsters to kill, uh, Shrine Minions, and that's all they need, so they're trying to get in, trying to get those last few. Crafty though with the nice slide onto Trape, able to confirm Jaina who was looking to get the poke to get the last couple minions down. Now it's going to come down to Knight if he can steal away this shrine. And Teus diving in. Will he be able to get it? Three more. Not a will be able to get they Knight down, it. but he is able to successfully steal away the Punisher. With as all in as they went there, they needed to get that. It, if they had lost the Punisher and had three deaths, then they would have been in a very bad position very early in this game. However, it's Punisher, they don't really have the personnel to really push with the, the Arcane Punisher, and even though it is the first one, not going to get too much value early on in the game. No, but what they are doing, since they recognize that they didn't have the people up to push with it, they are moving on to getting the Merc camps, which is probably the right call. Get that little extra experience, that little extra push pressure. 
And see, when you look at the top lane, what did that Bruiser camp accomplish? He's got a little bit of damage on the wall, pushed in the lane a little bit. They gave up basically that tr that uh, Punisher for that Bruiser camp, and I think that was a bit of an error. Not only that, but Nephilim's been able to put a lot of lane pressure in these bottom uh, two lanes, uh, taking both of the siege camps pretty early on. However, not deciding to really push the issue quite yet and try to take down a gate, instead just making sure that they get the XP in order to get to 10 before the next objective. Right, it's interesting that uh, Unavoid Gaming has five kills to Arrogant Nephilim zero, but they are... Arrogant Nephilim has a structure advantage, and as I say that, Arrogant Nephilim picks off ETC. Yeah, Crafty went aggressive again onto Anteus, but a n nice silence coming out from No Pointer just locked Crafty in place, and the damage was not enough from Unemployed to get the trade onto the Muradin. Yeah, right now they're missing a bit of so top. They can't just let uh, Zagara push top. They're going to... They, they really need to respond quick. They're going to lose this uh, well up there, and that's where the next shrine is going to pop. Nain is able to finish the scatter quest here, providing a nice bonus in damage. But the, I think the biggest problem is Unemployed has been looking for Antaeus in fights, uh, and they just don't have the damage to burst him down. Instead, Crafty needs to be looking to get into the back line in order to provide the opportunity for his team to get picks. Right. They... It, it's a little harder for ETC to get into the back line compared to Diablo. That is one of his weaknesses. You gotta find the right position and really commit to it. it looks like right now Arrogant and Nephilim might be going yeah, they're going for their top bruiser. It's the only camp left up. Unemployed gaming that they have to know they're there, whether or not they want to make the invade or not. Yeah, the problem is this bridge has been Kind of forced to just stay in the mid lane, or excuse me, top lane, in order to counter MIG's push. And now that they have Nidus up, MIG's going to be able to make a more of a presence, not just in the top lane, but uh, now in the bot lane as well. Right, and he's already rotating down bot, put down more creep, and establish more push. And he can delay Orphea from going up. He can put a heavy amount of push down bottom, and then immediately show up top. Bridge had a nice rotation down along with Nate and Zalt. In order to get the pick there onto Jaina, they're looking for more. Can they get the damage on the Knight? Crushing Jaws going to come out, catch no pointer, but able to get away successfully, uh, making it to where it's just the one pick. Uh, but that means that Unemployed's going to get a nice advantage early on in the Shrine phase. All right, they're going to get a little bit of damage on to their top four with that Bruiser camp. They're going to clear it pretty fast. Jaina's already back up, so... They're not going to get that advantage from that kill. They're not able to capitalize off of any of these kills that they're getting. And no. they're, doing, they're doing the Bruiser camp again. They're not doing the Shrine, they're doing the Bruiser camp. Especially because MIG still having to rotate from the bot lane, so if Unemployed was committing right now, they'd have a man advantage, but this has allowed MIG to come back and participate in the fight if Arrogant Nephilim wants to go in. And Teus looking for the potential engage, but both teams not willing to really go in quite yet and commit. Uh, instead, Crafty and Taze kind of dancing around each other. Crafty potentially seeing an opportunity to get into the back line and look for Trape, but just instead going to have to back up, taking a lot of damage to the Mosh Pit, able to actually Mosh. catch three. They don't have, they're Four. not able to interrupt it, as now it's a disaster for Nephilim. That's three members down already. Bridge looking for the kill on the Trape. No pointer able to get him away, but still a fantastic Mosh Pit from Crafty, able to help them secure this objective. Wow, I think No Porter wanted to go in there and use his swipe, but instead he walked right into the mosh pit, turning it a three-man mosh into a four-man mosh, and that's a punisher for unemployed gaming. Very nice done. Yeah, very pa uh, patient play from Crafty too. Uh, just walking into the back line, looking for the perfect opportunity, saw the lurking arm come out, and took that as, as an opportunity to be able to get the successful mosh pit and help unemployed pick up their first punisher of the game. Now, if Arrogant Nephilim can defend this without losing too much, Mig is already in bottom lane. He's already pushing in. He could easily trade 4 for 4 here with with the it, Unemployed Gaming having a Punisher. Punisher still at 80%, and well, Bridge has to peel off to deal with Mig's pressure. They're still going to have the four-man push looking for the keep wall, and potentially more if they're able to get a pick. Meanwhile, though, Punisher jumping on Anteus who eats the jump successfully as they're able to burst down the Punisher before it does too much damage in the top lane. 
Yeah, and they're backing out. I think that's the right call. You, you got what you could. You can't really get any more than that with uh, MIG pushing bottom lane right now. Yeah, Bridge must be calling for reinforcements, make able to do a ton of damage just with the Impaler camp as well as being able to kite away from Bridge so Bridge can't get any healing off of MIG. And so, however, with the members of Unemployed Gaming taking this Impaler camp, that's going to help them alleviate some of the pressure in the mid lane as well as help Bridge clear out the bot lane. Yes, and it's important to note that because MIG did go Nidus, that means that his team fight potential is a lot worse, so he has to make it heavy advantage of his global presence at all times. There we go, Nephilim I'm going to take this chance to step up. Crafty looking for the slide, not able to find it out. Bridge, not able to find the stun as well, so that will force Unemployed to back up, but they are looking to get aggressive here with MIG in the top lane. Yeah, right now, I think what Unemployed Gaming really wants to do is to find a pick with their five men and then send somebody to respond to MIG, because he could be anywhere at any time. However, Nephilim is just happy to sit back and not chance it. Instead, it looks like they're going to be rotating up to take their bruiser camp. Uh, scouted out, though, successfully from Pimor, so they're going to back up from that opportunity instead just stay in the mid lane. And I'd like this call to possibly invade the top camp. MIG is showing on map, and the second that he does, they can move in. But they're kind of all split right now, trying to get so kind to respond to MIG. He's already gotten a huge amount of pressure into this bot lane without any response happening in time. And now with Bridge responding, that's the green light for Nephilim to take their Bruiser camp here, knowing that uh, Unemployed can't really afford to go for an invade now that they're missing their Imperious player. And look at Antaeus' position. He's, he's anchoring in that bush. He was doing a really good job of giving his team vision, preventing Unemployed Gaming from catching them by surprise. Crafty barely able to slide away from Antaeus' hammer. And so, it will be Arrogant Nephilim looking to push a little bit the top lane, or at least put some pressure, that Unemployed will have to eventually respond to. Yes, and this is kind of been the story so far that Unemployed Gaming has been winning the team fights, but has also been behind in responding to the macro pressure from Arrogant Nephilim. They've, won they've pretty much won every engagement here, but still, the structures are nearly even, with half of the bottom fort gone, top being pushed in by bruisers. They have the 16 advantage now, they really want to press it. Yeah, XP the one area that Unemployed still holds an advantage in currently, with that one level advantage. Going to have 16 advantage for about 30 more seconds here, but Arrogant Nephilim going to quickly be able to soak that up, so that they will uh, be able to teamfight in this next shrine phase. Let's see. There's a lot of pressure right now happening bot lane on that bot keep. They could easily lose this keep it, during this objective, and they really need to win this objective right now with all of 16. Arrogant Nephilim does not want this fight. Yep. They, they were able, though, to get 11 minions down 16 because, again, Unemployed was taking their bruiser camp. So now with 16, though, Intace is going to be looking for an opening. Yeah, I, th I think that Unemployed Gaming is doing a l is being a little slow with taking that Bruiser camp. They want to be on it before the Shrine is finished bombing. It looks like they might get this. They only need nine more. A nice silence there from No Pointer, able to zone out Crafting Bridge to death for now. However, Unemployed happy to just sit back now and let their backline finish off the rest of this objective. Bridge to death now going in, looking for the mosh pit, able to successfully find it onto. Jaina, so that will be her going down for now, and that's honestly enough value for Unemployed, and especially because Jaina is the main punish, Punisher damage dealer uh, to help with the defense from Nephilim. Alright, Big had already, had already backed out there. I don't think that was a good use of the battle cruiser there. You were pretty much going to lose the Punisher at that point. Probably wanted to save that for defense. Yeah, especially now with Murden now, with the nice ult combination Long for them to get yet another pick from Unemployed. They're going to be looking to take this keep down in the mid lane. In fact, they're looking for more bridge, looking for the kill on the night, but it will end up actually being Stukov who goes down. And so already turning onto the keep, it's just Knight and now Mig being forced to rotate down to help with the defense as well. Arrogant Nephilim's losing all the advantages that they'd hit, built up prior to this objective. Right. The Frozen Punisher right now is the strongest uh, Punisher of the three, and you have to really have to be careful when he comes out. This could... If, they, if Unemployed Gaming gets one more pick, this could be game. 
but it looks like they are content to get their keep and get more map pressure. The knight being the crucial one able to escape, and so although unemployed will now get their run of the map, being up that keep in the mid lane, uh, that will allow for Eric and Nephilim to at least extend this game and give them a chance to come back. Right. The game isn't over until it's over, especially with Zagara, she can easily respond to map pressure anywhere, so uh, uh, until you finally get that core down to 0%, you can't rest on your laurels. Also, still, some... the story of this game right now, I think, is the 12 to 1. 12 kills to 1. Something else to note is that 20 is right on the horizon here for unemployed. So if you're Arrogant Nephilim, sure you need to start coming back, but you might need to just take a fight before Unemployed gets a, their huge 20 advantage for a long time. They're looking for the engage on Enteus here from Unemployed. Nice spear along with the crushing jaws. Gonna lock him up, but it's Whoa. actually gonna be Orphea who ends up going down. Moshpit is able to catch two members, but no follow-up gonna uh, able to secure any kills. Now it's Crafty who's gonna be going very low. Will end up getting stunned up, going down. A huge stun from Pimor, but the damage is already down on the side of Unemployed. It's just Nathan, who could be looking for kills, as now they're looking to see if they can finish off Bread to Death. Some nice healing for Pimor, gonna keep him up for now and allow for him to get away, but still a crucial team fight win for Arrogant Nephilim. That was a 4v5 they took down two levels. MIG is pushing top. They can easily turn this into a 4v5 horrible pickoff scenario into two forts and maybe even more. Now unemployed, trying to rotate up to catch MIG. It looks like they might have found it. Bridge getting the spear onto MIG as the creep's movement speed buff not able to do it. However, Hanzo will still end up going down. You'll take that trade if you're arrogant Nephilim. Well, yeah, that MIG was out of position. He was overextended, but still somehow managed to trade one for one. But right now, they need Arrogant Nephilim needs to go back. They're sending Knight back because that is catapults on the core. Let's see if it actually get, is able. It looks like he's going to get that shield down. Maybe. Yeah, and nice knockback. No! Knight able to save the shield or save a little bit of core health for now. As 20 advantage from unemployed coming now, but they're not going to be able to do it still down Hanzo. And Arrogant Nephilim about to achieve 20 as well. It's going to be an even fight for the shrine. It's going to be an even fight for the Shrine, and they have nearly evened up the map pressure. The top lane is even. They have advantage bottom, and with the Shrine in that position, they are at a good spot to respond to mid. Not only that, but mid going to be able to uh, rotate a little bit faster uh, than Hanzo as Inteus looking to potentially zone up bridge. As now bridge well, Hanzo, ends up going in. Game, here it comes. Here comes play of the game. Ends up hitting to leap. Our Trape, as they're able to get the kill onto Jaina, now Knight the one in trouble, able to successfully back out. Nathan looking for the kill, will be able to finish off Knight, as Anteus looking for the response onto Nathan. But some a nice heal coming in from Pimor, will be able to keep up Nathan through the fight. Now it's Anteus actually in trouble, taking the damage, will end up going down for Rexpa. So a three for nothing trade will allow for Unemployed Gaming to be able to pick up the objective. I'm surprised that they're not just running down middle right now, trying to end. Not only that, but... three kills, 50 seconds, it's all the way pushed in. But, and Looks there's like still they're... a four and a keep in the bot lane, so defense might still be possible here from Arrogant Nephilim, as uh, Unemployed gonna hold it at 39 for now, as they take the bot sea champ to help with their push, but I agree, this might be a potential missed core call. It, it definitely, if Arrogant Nephilim is able to come back from this, remember this shrine moment. With 50 seconds on the, on the death timers, that was, and with them already midway there, they could barely so easily have pushed it. Now, Unemployed is playing this well if they didn't have such an advantage already taking down the fort and pushing with the siege camp before picking up the final minion. But, it uh, should be interesting to see if they are able to end the game with the 19 minute Punisher. Yeah, 19 minute Punisher, it's gonna be very hard for Arrogant Nephilim to defend, but they do have Raynor with Execute, so he can burn down that Punisher pretty fast if he's given the opportunity. Yeah, ults will be even in this fight, as it will be uh, Crafty looking for the engage in. Bridge ends up going very deep, but is forced away from No Pointer uh, for now. Good swipes from No Pointer, good swipes. Yeah. Yep. 
they are able to bring the Punisher to the core in order to help burn it down a little bit faster, but the keep will now be going down from unemployed as the tension turns towards the core. And that Punisher is almost down. This is not game unless they can get some picks. Shield is now down. Bridge, it looks like Unemployed is going to commit to the core. Core going down to 50, but the Ring of Frost ends up hitting three members. And that might be the game saver there from Trape. Rexpa going in, able to get the response kill. But that will be the five-man team wipe from Arrogant Nephilim. Going to save the game, and now they're going to be looking to potentially do some damage to Unemployed. I don't know what they can get done here. Maybe take camps. There's... If the lanes are all the way pushed in, they're down Jaina, I don't think they could do much with this advantage other than be grateful that they got the mega kill. Yeah, but however, the game is not over yet. It looks like they are going to be looking for the bot lane, looking to, with Meg, be able to do enough siege damage to take down the keep and at least even out one lane in terms of pressure and catapults. Uh, however, it's going to be close still, 20 seconds away until unemployed respawns. Right, they need to get this, get it quick, and then back out. They have 20 seconds or less, less than 20 seconds before they're going to be dove on. However, the quick burst coming in from Knight and Mig's ability to siege quickly, it looks like they will be able to get the keep, and with the members just now responding from unemployed, we'll be able to also get out. So a nice defense and also opportunity taken up for members by Arrogant Nephilim. Now, Arrogant Nephilim has to always be aware of the back door. If Unemployed Gaby just rushes the core when the objective is up, they can just burn it down before they can respond. They always have to be aware of where Unemployed Gaming is at all times. Unemployed gone, the aggr uh, aggressors looking to take Arrogant Nephilim's siege camp here. Tay sees that, keeping vision. But Arrogant Nephilim just trying to stay back here and stabilize mid and top lane to make sure that they, uh, the catapults don't backdoor their core as well. Right. It's a very precarious position. You can't allow for any mistakes here if you're Arrogant Nephilim. You have to constantly be vigilant, constantly be wary. Meanwhile, Unemployed going to take this opportunity with the amount of space they have just to take as many siege camps as they can on the map for now, as well as... Uh, try to take their bruiser camp. Meanwhile, Arrogant Nephilim just trying to respond to all the pressure Unemployed is putting on the map. Right, and this is going to be a mid-shrine, so this would be game if, if it was gotten by Unemployed Gaming, not necessarily game if gotten by Arrogant Nephilim, unless they win their shrine and then they just go straight by. And gonna have to keep an eye. And Teus has been trying to keep as much vision as possible, just trying to uh, make sure that the back door not coming out from unemployed as for now it looks like they are going to commit to the shrine and Rex was showing bottom the rest of his team is top Eric Nephilim can if they can get this pick this will be huge and taste using the resets but instead it's going to be the Hanzo arrow going to be able to peel for Rex but for now and now it, unemployed looking to go on the attack Mig is cut out a little bit with the jaws but a nice swipe there Able to keep uh, Mig up, but just for a little bit. Now in comes the dance. Mosh Pit from ETC. Able to actually catch four members there uh, of Arrogant Nephilim. A little Again, bit of a misstep from Tribe and Anteus, as That's going to be three for nothing trade in favor of Unemployed. They walked into the Mosh Pit again. Trade had a beautiful four-man ring, and he walked into the Mosh. Now Anteus is able to get the trade there on the Hanzo, but... Now it's Rexpelt looking for blood. Can they get the kill onto Anteus? It looks like they will be able to soon. Anteus surviving, but will end up going down as now Unemployed gonna make the core call. And with the core down to 32% already, and with just Jaina up, I believe they're gonna be able to finish this game out. It would have to be an extremely amazing play by Jaina in order to stop this from happening. I don't see how it's possible. Trabe with the ring able to catch one but forced the ice block just to survive through damage. Rexbug gonna finish him off anyways as that will be game number one going over to the side of unemployed gaming. Wow, that was so close. It was truly anyone's game at the end. If they had been just slightly faster on rotating on, on Rexba, that would have been a completely different game.
slight positioning errors too with walking into those mosh pits. I I wonder if Jaina could have finished off on a unemployed gaming there if she hadn't just taken that extra step forward. Yeah, as now we look to some of the post-game stats, uh, your leaders, Trave on the Jaina, uh, led the game with uh, 59k damage. Meanwhile, Rexpo, though, not far behind with uh, just under 59,000. Uh, the healing leader is pretty much close. P more slightly edging out no pointer in that category. And meanwhile, Anteus took a lot more damage uh, as actually uh, Bridge was the leading uh, tank in terms of uh, damage taken on the side of Unemployed Gaming. The most impressive thing here is how close all these numbers were, except that Unemployed Gaming turned their numbers into 12 more pits, 12 more kills. Like, the damage is very close. The, there's only, you know, a couple thousand between, but the damage was much more impactful for Unemployed Gaming. Yeah, almost able to turn it around on the side of Arrogant Nephilim, but just uh, overstepped their bounds by a little bit, trying to get the pick on the Rexpa. And the turnaround from Unemployed was able to finally finish off the game, as now it's going to come down to Arrogant Nephilim in their choice of whether they want the map or the first pick. Yes, yeah. a little bit of overextension by Sagara. She really wanted to get on that Orphea, but... As a result, she was a little bit too far forward and was able to get counter-engaged. Very nice uh, attempt by Arrogant Nephilim to get the pick. Very nice counter-engage once the, the were dove upon. But Unemployed Gaming was just able to execute a little bit better and came out with the win. Yep, it, Arrogant Nephilim actually going to pick first pick, so it's going to come down to Unemployed to see where they take us next. If I am unemployed gaming, I probably want a three lane map with a similar rotation to shrines. Or potentially also being able to fight in that uh, smaller area as Ultrac was taken out. So, or excuse me, uh, Alt uh, Volskaya actually is available if that maybe might be the option they want to go with. Well, Skaya, uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen, both have a strong rotational aspect with a lot of team fighting. Those are the things that Unemployed Gaming did the best in, in this series, so, or in this game so far, and that's what they should be focusing on. Uh, they were asking about talents. Zag did not take Global Creep at 20. They uh, Zag took Fury of the Storm. Uh, rewind on Muradin. Play of the game, Hanzo. A lot of very standard uh, picks here. ETC went Storm Shield at 20 instead of Deathmosh. Just trying to provide a little bit of survivability, I guess, in those last couple of fights. Uh, he was success. I don't believe uh, Crafty died during a mosh, though, so I guess he consider he didn't need it and wasn't being aggressive enough to really get value out of Deathmosh. True, he did get some value out of that Storm Shield. Uh, interesting that Jaina went Frost Shards at 4, but not the uh, Q Talent at 7. Instead going for Ice Flows at 7 and Numbing Blast at uh, 16. It looks like Unemployed gonna choose Towers of Doom here for game number 2. Towers of Doom, another good map that's all about the rotations. It's a map where you're truly never out until the final bit of the core is gone. But it's also a map where it's really easy to establish control and keep it. It's not a good map for Zagara, but it is a good map for people who can do the double soak rotation, which Zagara, she can do it, but she gets she can very easily get picked off while she's doing that. Yeah, I think Unemployed just didn't want to go to a map where Zagar can be as viable, especially when you're, you have as many forced fights as Towers kind of uh, does of during that alter phase. So uh, definitely would be more of a surprise if we saw Zagar appear yet again. Right. Zagar is someone that you want on a map where you can get a permanent structure advantage. Uh, just getting the temporary structure advantage for Zagar 
She can take it. She won't be able to keep it. It'll be interesting to see how they, uh, how they, Arrogant Nephilim adapts to this, how they're going to change their offlane situation, how they coordinate their four man. With the first pick, they have a lot of options on what tanks they can want to pick, what damage they pick. They have a very wide open uh, draft here coming up. Should be interesting to see uh, what Rexpa ends up going on to. I uh, made a huge impact on the Orphea to clean up the kills last fight. Should be interesting to see what hero he decides to go with in this game. Right, he was very impactful on Orphea. He might just stick with that. Their dive comp worked really well. I don't see any reason why, as long as they get, you know, Toronto and ETC, why they would change their draft pretty much at all. Meanwhile, uh, something also to be keeping an eye on is... Uh, the main tank situation, we saw uh, ETC Murden with Anubrak making it through the draft. I don't know if that's going to necessarily be the case uh, this time around. Uh, so, it uh, should be interesting to see how the teams play it in terms of the main tanks. Right. Once again, I think that with first pick, they have to decide whether or not what part of their strategy they want to focus on. Is ETC most important? Crafty's ETC was very impactful in that game. They might want to just take him off that. Maybe ETC is a comfort pick. If they could secure ETC for their team or ban it out, then maybe they can secure uh, an advantage for their team by putting him on a tank that he's less comfortable with. But given that they banned KTZ uh, in the first draft, there could Rexford could play KTZ. Uh, Noten could play KTZ. If that's the case, KTZ is very strong on a small um, uh, four lane or small bot mid rotation on the Towers of Doom. Teams just now settling in, and we're almost ready to go here uh, for the draft. Uh, again, it should be interesting to see uh, if the teams do decide to swap up the uh, bands too, depending on the last game. Uh, especially with uh, Kale likely not going to be banned out this time by Unemployed. Kale is still very strong on this map with all the tight corridors that you're forced into fighting. Very strong Diablo map too. I'd be very surprised if nobody picks up Diablo here. As you said, it's going to be up to Arrogant Nephilim this time around to set the tone in the draft. Let's see what they decide to ban first off. Are they going to go with what they banned before, Sylvanas, KTZ, or are they going to pick out a problem from the last game and try to isolate it? Going to take a little bit of time, though, in order to think out the first ban. Both of these teams yet to come to Towers of Doom this season either, although it is still both of their second matches of this year, as actually it's going to be Hanzo who ends up being banned out first by Ergen Nephilim. Right, the, scatter, the Scattershot build that worked before can also work here. Uh, a lot of tight spaces, a lot of walls, a lot of ways to easily rack up damage. Ana being denied by Unemployed Gaming. Toronto going to be the response from Ergen Nephilim uh, just to take away... Uh, some of the more sustained healers, I'd argue, right now, uh, are dominant sustained heroes. And as you said, Kale going to be banned out yet again by Unemployed Gaming. Yeah, I, I think that the thing about Toronto that they wanted to get rid of was the combo potential, where she would follow up the stun with a stun. Savannah's instantly going to be picked up by Trabe this game. Meanwhile, Anubrak will be picked up first by Unemployed. Uh, interesting to see how they utilize Anubrak this time uh, with Crafty playing him. Anubrak ate a couple of nerfs, but he's still strong in stealing away the Stuka from Null Pointer. Definitely going to get to have Taranda, so they decided, well, if we can't have Taranda, you can't have Stuka. Meanwhile, Johanna could be picked up now before likely banned by unemployed in that third ban phase. 
uh, looking again to, uh, to Anteus to be protecting the backline from a Crafty's likely engage onto Trape, and now no pointer on the Anduin. Anduin, who provides a lot of good escapes for your team if you get it out of position, uh, he has a two good ults to use, uh, the one which can negate damage and the other one which can give you an extra stun for the team, and with Johanna's ability to have two stuns on her own, that can easily rack up a very long stun comp. Malthale actually going to be a banned uh, by Unemployed. Has been played, uh, was played bo two times by Eric and Ephilim in their last match, so definitely uh, well used by them in the offlane. Uh, so good to see in the third ban slot. Right, and Malthale can move about the map very quickly while people are focused on the bottom lane. He can very easily soak uh, mid and top. Imperius going to be denied away from Bridge's pick last game. Uh, was able to get some nice uh, flanks coming in from the, his rotations from the solo lane. So want to deny that away. Instead, he's going to be on Leoric this time around, uh, as well as Nathan on the Lee Ming. Uh, so should be interested to see how the tanks are going to be able to set up Nathan in this game. Right, this is a, a good place to take Li Ming on. The, the wave clear is important, but those fights on the shrines, they're just straight up big man fights, and getting those picks are super important. So they're going to need somebody to follow up with a little bit more wave clear for them, but otherwise, good pick up with Nathan on Li Ming. Meanwhile, Knight actually could be on the Zul'jin and Mig on the Phoenix this time to counter the Yorick. Uh, so, again, going to have an interesting backline. I'm very interested, interested to see a Mig on the Phoenix this time, uh, making more of an impact in the team fights as not on Zagara this time around. Right, and it, it'll be interesting also to see what build trade goes with Sylvanas. If he goes W build, then with Zul'jin, his team is an extremely late game comp. They want to pick up those stacks. And Valera! Rex on Valera, that is a shock to me. Yeah, they're going to be uh, very much committing to getting that pick in the back line uh, with Crafty and Rexpa going in uh, in order to get the resets going for Nathan. So it's going to come down to the first couple seconds in team fights whether Unemployed's able to get that quick first kill uh, to set Nathan off, or else they might be in trouble. Right, and one potential weakness from uh, Arrogant Nephilim, and we saw this in the previous game, they, their tank is their only front line, whereas for Unemployed Gaming, they have Leoric, they have Anubarak, they have some very chunky front line to soak up the damage, and to, whereas Johanna has to be working in overtime. Phoenix is not that tough <laughs> but he can deal with Leoric easily by kiting him around Leoric can't engage on Phoenix but he can Phoenix can very easily be rotated on by Valera and get picked off here you go looking to stay alive it's arrogant Nephilim in game number two it's going to be Antaeus on the Johanna Trabe on the Sylvanas no pointer on Anduin Knight on Zul'jin and Ming on uh, Ming on the Phoenix and for Unemployed Gaming, we have Nathan on Lee Ming, Respa on Valera, Bridge to Death on the York, P. Moore on Stukov, and Crafty on Anubarak. One thing also with that Valera pick last is that Unemployed Gaming is severely lacking the wave clear compared to Arrogant Nephilim. Uh, really, Leoric is arguably the best wave clear uh, on the Unemployed side. Leoric is the best wave clear on their side. Phoenix is the best wave clear for Arrogant Nephilim, and both are in the off lane. Zul'jin doesn't have necessarily great wave clear. Sylvana says, okay. It's really Johanna that is going to be the meat of this four-man getting the wave clear accomplished. Already sending Rexpa in the bot lane to get their clear going there. As the four-man now rotating in from Arrogant Nephilim, Rexpa knows this, though, and is going to be able to... Uh get away successfully before getting picked off. Yeah, I think that that is probably the wisest move right there, getting that, and, oh, we have a four-man push on bot with mid clearing out mid. 
Yep, it looks like it's going to be a true battle in the solo laners to see who can really make a, a potentially a large XP gap. As we see Rexba going in on tonight, uh, not able to quite find the damage. Uh, start actually opening up with the blind on tonight. And so just going to be backing off for now as already Ming Mig with the clear advantage to get that XP. Right, I don't know who necessarily clears faster. I do know that before level four, at least, Mig will have the advantage with the wave clear before uh, uh, New York gets Neil Peasants. Uh, Arrogant Nephilim knows that Unemployed Gaming is taking this camp, but going to decide to instead trade out their camp. Meanwhile, however, it does force for Crafty to have to go into this mid lane in order to help out bridge with his uh, rotations in order to help soak this mid lane. Right, and they're rotating up on top. Mig, if he hasn't sniffed this out, he is going to die. Yeah. Don't face check that bush. <laughs> he extends a little far forward and he gets doved on. Can he get away? Able to get the TP in. Bridge ends up missing the drain hope, so he will be able to. And so with the four man in the bot lane, Arrogant Nephilim gonna get a nice siege advantage. Actually, Crafty ends up getting rooted, but the heals come in, in time from Pimor in order to save his life. That's pretty big. They really needed to get that rotation on Megan, get to secure that kill with all that they devoted there. With Sylvanas in the bot lane, that could have been a lot worse for unemployed game. Trave, though, taking a lot of damage from Nate and forced to back up and not really get much value out of the uh, trait being popped. And so, uh, overall, not too much damage being done, uh, but I agree they really need to get that pick in the top lane with Rex by rotating up. Right. The thing that Arrogant Nephilim was able to secure from that was they were able to push in their three pumpkins into the bottom lane. They weren't able to get value necessarily from Sylvanas, but they were able to make their mercenary camp do work. Meanwhile, uh, Unemployed not going to be looking in the bot lane to necessarily be contesting. Instead, it's going to be Rexba in the top lane going in with Crafty onto Mig yet again. Will they be able to get the kill? Looks like Mig going to be able to teleport away. However, uh, Unemployed Gaming going to take a, an early four-shot lead I, in this game. I, I think this was a mistake. They focused way too much on top. Sylvanas is in the bot lane. She's turning this off. They're pushing this in. Now they have the minion wave uh, to account for the fact Trabe and Knight are low. However, with them knowing that Rexpa is rotating down, they don't want to overstay their welcome too much and wait to heal up Trabe and Knight before uh, potentially uh, going in yet again to finish off that bot fort. I'm a little curious what happened there because it, it looked like Sylvanas' trait turned off really soon. Uh, if she, it, she didn't need to use it to turn off the tower, she should have saved it just to turn off the down there. Now, Arrogant Nephilim going to start with four-man rotation going in between mid and bot while Unemployed Gaming starting on their siege camp. However, in comes the invade from Arrogant Nephilim and Teus going in, looking for the engaged zone out Pimor, who's able to stay in. Crafty, though, going to be taking a lot of damage so far in this fight. Bridge of Death going to be rotating in. Mig is not available for this fight. Rexpa going in onto Trape. Will they be able to get the kill? Will be able to find it. Now it's Antaeus in a lot of trouble. No point are able to get the save onto Antaeus for now, but will be forced to back up and give his life to make sure no more casualties on the side of Arrogant Nephilim. I, I, d I do not like that engage. They, they went in there without Mig being nearby. They, they should have had him come down to help because that was a good fight for them 4v4 until the Orc came in from behind and just decimated their team. And now it's going to allow for Unemployed to be able to escort in these sappers in the bot lane and uh, get uh, closer at least to evening out the pressure advantage Arrogant Nephilim had built up in the early game. Right. Uh, uh, unemployed Gaming is able to secure that early kill. They're going to be able to probably turn this into another kill and get a more tower shot advantage. Yeah, nice coronation from Rexpa and Nathan. Able to find the pick yet again onto Meg. As no one was channeling from Arrogant Nephilim on the bot one and said trying to commit to the mid fight uh, while Bridge was in the top lane. No point are now going to be trying to get the cap as the cap already threw in the mid lane from Unemployed Gaming. But Bridge now here to go in onto Inteus, taking a lot of damage just from the drain hope. And Crafty and Bridge Def are going to be able to successfully zone out the remaining members of Arrogant Nephilim to allow for them to get a nice 12 shot advantage now in this game. 
very nicely done by Unemployed Gaming. They were able to secure a kill, and they were very focused. They got mid and moved to bot. They seem to have a plan, a solid plan, and they're executing on it. I I think that Arrogant Deathloom is a little bit confused about what they want to do, but they're pushing in the bottom hard right now. This is where they want to be. This is what they want to do. Arrogant Nephilim going to take this chance to push in before tens obtained by Unemployment Gaming. However, it's Rexwell who's going to be going and be able to delete to uh, Talib as now Zuljin in trouble. Bridge end up ends up going down, and Tay is going to be trying to back up Rexwell, getting this done onto him as well. As now all is left is No Pointer, it, who got cocooned, will end up going down as well. So four for nothing man advantage for Unemployed Gaming. They're going to be looking to take this bottom bell tower. Again, they committed there, they didn't have Phoenix nearby, Leoric was able to rotate down on them and help out, and also, super important, Unemployed Gaming was able to get Valera in the back line, completely unopposed, and just tear them apart. Yeah, you're gonna need to see a response from Arrogant Nephilim to Rexpa's Valera, who's been able to uh, basically turn around fights as soon as he's able to find the engage he wants in all of these fights. Right now, Unemployed Gaming is doing a great job of map control, good macro pressure, knowing where the enemy team is and how to respond to it. Arrogant Nephilim needs to keep an eye on that Leoric, know where he is, and not take fights where they can get rotated on. Uh, for Arrogant Nephilim, going to try to take back their towers back, uh, their tower back before the altar ends up spawning. However, Unemployed Gaming going to be able to respond in time. As they will send Bridge to start the cap going now, while Trape desperately trying to take back the fort in time. However, they're just easily going to be zoned out here. And said in goes Crafty, while Rexpa ends up going on to Knight. Lightbomb going to go out onto Antaeus, able to catch Rexpa as well as Crafty. Can they get the damage follow up though to really make a difference? Instead, it will actually be Johanna who goes down. Uh, nice and Tomb catches two members. Trape will, will end up going down as well. It's just Mig and No Pointer left here. Dayton trying to confirm the kill onto Mig as well. Not able to quite find it, but now they're going to be able to escort in, I believe, all three sappers in order to get even a larger advantage, going up 20 shots now in this game. Right, this is a problem that I said early on. With the Savannah, Trayvon Savannah's... With Savannah's on that, and Zuljin being who he is, they are a late game comp. They do not activate until... Sylvanas is stacked up and Zul Zuljin has finished his quest, especially since he went Headhunter at level 1. And right now, with no kills, he has no stacks. Rexpa going in to look for the kill, will be able to find it there on the Zuljin. Now Antaeus going low, will end up going down as well. So it looks like Unemployed Gaming could be able to escort in yet another three more sappers here and really uh, not let up on Arrogant Nephilim. Right now, Arrogant Nephilim is all they could do to just stop the bleeding. They need to get that bottom shrine under control, and then get a level equals and just focus on the objectives. Unemployed Gaming now uh, with Arrogant Nephilim trying to take back bot. Going to try to take boss and allow for them to have a potential uh, win con in this fight if they're able to take both of the altars. Now that's four shots, that brings it down to nine, they'll be one short. You're right, as they were able to get the cap in the bot lane from Trape, as now in goes Antaeus, but ends up getting Cocoon here in the fight. So Crafty and Bridge to Death gonna get free reign here in the back line. And Tomb ends up hitting Mig, but just able to teleport out for now as Antaeus has been popped from the Cocoon. Light Bomb gonna catch three members there. Can they get the kill onto Bridge to Death? He will end up going low, will end up going down there, but the trade out comes onto Meg. Now also, Rexpa able to find the kill onto Zul'jin. And Tayas trying to desperately zone out and potentially find the kill on the Crafty, but Pimor able to come through with the burst heal. And Tayas going very low, able to get the trait in time, but so try, uh, Trabe able, going to sacrifice his life for it, as now that it's going to be down to one core health for Arrogant Nephilim. Arrogant Nephilim hanging on by a thread, but they're down 12 to 16. It's about to be a 13 to 16 advantage for Unemployed Gaming. I don't see any way for Arrogant Nephilim to pull themselves out of this. I think that, I, I, I hate to say it on Towers of Doom, but I think that Unemployed Gaming has basically secured the win for just waiting to see it end. Yeah, 16 advantage about to come through for Unemployed Gaming. Perhaps if Arrogant Nephilim able to find a fight now, that might be their last ditch effort to try to turn it back around. 
uh, they're going to be rotating into this bot lane in order to try to alleviate some of the pressure as Bridge ends up taking the top fight. Antaeus ends up going in with the Blessed Shield onto Rexpa and Crafty, but the Light Bomb does not hit Crafty, so Arrogant or Unemployed able to take uh, the uh, Siege Camp as now Antaeus ends up going in deep looking for the engage, but 16 is now out from Unemployed. They're go looking to turn it around onto Antaeus. Rexpa will be able to finish off the kill as now it looks like the Cocoon going out onto a Tribe. Knight end up being the focus fire from Rexpa. We'll also end up going down Nathan. Looking to confirm the kill onto Trape. Will they be able to get it? Trape desperately trying to put the damage out on Nathan. P more there for the heals. We'll be able to confirm Sylvanas as well. As now it's just no pointer and Meg up. Uh, and with a triple altar phase. I don't want to say it's over, but that's basically it. There's no way to respond here. You got 20 seconds before Sylvanas up. You have to contest all three of these at the same time while down 16. This is about as impossible as impossible is. Unemployed Gaming just gonna group up here at the mid altar. Bridge to Death just trying to delay in the Johanna. Ends up getting root and CC comboed into Death. As now it's going to be no pointer. Will he give his life in order to extend the game a little bit more? Will not, as that will be a dominant victory here to close out the series by Unemployed Gaming. Very nicely done by Unemployed Gaming. Very strong showing here. Getting a 36-0 win on Towers of Doom. Yeah, and overall a pretty dominant showing, I'd say, for... Uh, unemployed gaming as well first game almost kind of lost a little bit not going for the core when they were up uh, five members to one with an open core but able to make sure that they close out that game and then show very dominant showing in game number two uh, when we looked at the stats it was Nate on the lead being able to get the resets to lead the game with 45,000 damage meanwhile P more uh, out healed his uh, out healed no pointer uh, 50k to 30,000 and then Crafty only taking 40k compared to Antaeus' 55,000. Right, these are were two very, very different games. Last game was very close uh, in how it ended. This game, very one-sided on the favor of Unemployed Gaming. They had a very dominant showing with just got a, secured a lot of kills. Valyria's damage might be low, but that damage pretty much always secured a kill. Yeah, they just didn't have the response to that last pick, Valera from Rexpa, who was just able to kind of pick out his target. Uh, commonly, Knight get the uh, blind onto Knight to kind of take him out of the fight, and then allow, get the pick basically in the fight, and then start it off for Knight, and they get the resets in order to push through his damage in a lot of the team fights. Yeah, Underplay game had a very strong early game, and... Eric Nephilim needed the game to go on long, and Unemployed Gaming did not comply. But very good showing by both teams. Very good series. Uh, let's put the talents. Looking and seeing some standard. The W build on Sylvanas for new on Anduin. All very standard picks, I believe. Exactly. As we're waiting to see if we can maybe get one of the members of Unemployed Gaming for an interview after this match. Uh, but uh, Unemployed Gaming actually getting on the board now uh, with their domination victory over Arrogant Nephilim uh, to get their first three points as well for this NGS season. Yeah, very good job by Unemployed Gaming. You should be very happy with this win. we wait to see the response here from uh, unemployed gaming i mean what do you think were some of the uh, the key factors overall 
in uh, game number one. Going back game to game number, number one. one. Going back to game number one, it, it came down to being able to execute their comp. Uh, what Unemployed Gaming wanted to do was to get the picks, get the engages, and prevent Arrogant Nephilim from creating the macro pressure with Zagara. And Arrogant Nephilim, they were able to create a lot of pressure, but it wasn't able to match up the deficits that happened with the, the lack of the team fight. They very nearly came back with some very good plays by Jaina, but it was that last engage trying to get Rexba. If they had managed to pick him off, if they had gotten that rotation slightly faster, it's a completely different game. Yep, it will actually be Rexba uh, who will be joining us to talk about the match at hand. Hello, Rexba. Hey, what's up? Uh, first off, congratulations uh, on your win. A very dominant victory, I'd say, especially after game number two. Yeah, it felt really good. Uh, feel It just felt like everything just kind of went together, so it was a really good win for us. Uh, Rexba, I, first off, I want to talk about game number one uh, at the end there. I was kind of curious, were you trying to bait Arrogant Nephilim out? What were you doing down there in the bottom lane? Yeah, you do like that? <laughs> All right. So let me, uh, I'll give you a play-by-play -play on how it happens. Okay. So we we knew how, what was going to happen. Um, they had to pretty much be aware of us backdooring the game at any point because they had 32% core to keep them. So the play was to push out bottom wave. Obviously, then if they pushed out bottom wave, we would have double key or double uh, catapults pushing keep and they would have to back. But we knew that the rotation was going to come down. And then I'm just going to be honest with you. When you're better than their entire team, you know you're going to dodge all their skill shots anyway. So they all got baited down. Muradin wasted, re uh, wasted rewind. Hanzo arrow came down. We turned around, wiped him. It was an easy win after that. Um. Yeah, that, that team fight at the end does seem to be like the deciding factor. Uh, what about the call to, uh, to to finish the Punisher instead of going to core mid? Did you think that you weren't going to be able to finish that? Or do you want to do the safer play? What was going through your head then? Um, we didn't want the, we just didn't want the game to end too quickly. Uh, you know, we just enjoyed the game. We just like playing as a group. We don't get to play that much together. So we knew we could have ended. So we just, you know, we made the cards like, oh, should we end? Or like, no, we just enjoy playing the game. We can end at pretty much any point in this game. So uh, we decided to do Punisher, you know, throw once or twice at core, give them, a, you know, some hope so the game could be interesting. So that was the main reason. All right. Moving on to, to game number two, uh, what was going through your mind during that draft? Like, walk me through that process. Uh, honestly, we knew that they were going to take Sylv early, uh, so we just left Sylv in a new brack open. We 100% knew that Sylv was going to be taken. We took a new brack. We told Crafty to insta lock it, you know, kind of show some dominance in draft, but Crafty just wanted to take his time. I think he was on the bathroom or something. I mean, you know, you can't really control that. Or he was on the toilet, not on the bathroom. But, you know, they just kept locking in all of these super squishy backliners. So, I mean, if you see that many squishy backliners, what's your first thought? It's obviously Valira. So you just lock that in. You take your four and a half second blind at level 13 on Valira. Zul'jin does nothing for the rest of the game. It was just free win. Um, so we weren't really worried. The draft kind of, we were actually surprised that they only play one tank. I'm pretty sure they did that both games. Um, so they played four back lines, so it was just kind of, that's kind of like a Valera's, like, fantasy, pretty much, and they played exactly into that, and then kind of the game just showed you what happened with silence and silencing the healer, or silencing Sylvana so she can't EOA, or blinding for four and a half seconds on Zul'jin, so I don't know what they were thinking, but, uh, in our minds, it just kind of went exactly the way we wanted yeah, very dominating win. Uh, did you make any changes because of the patch for your preparation for these games for 
Uh, did you focus on different heroes? Did you think some were stronger? Um, not really. Uh, our team before was just playing like complete potatoes. So, you know, you just got to tell your team that they suck and that they need to perform better. And then, you know, once you hard flame your team members enough, then they know it's, you know, it's them. They're the issue on the team. And so then once they start playing better, you know, you bring in another person on the team. Um, actually, we brought on Bridge, Bridge to Death. He's actually worse than our other solo laners, but, you know, we figured if we bought some more competition in the off lane that, uh, you know, they would start to, they would start to step up, but everyone's just been playing terrible. But we're still learning. We'll get there eventually. Well, you sound pretty confident. Are there any teams in uh, Division B West that you're on the lookout for? Um, not really. We're actually looking to take our talents to uh, Heroic Division here in a couple weeks once uh, the mods see how powerful we are as, we are as a team. Um, so you'll probably see us for one or two more weeks, and then we'll move up in divisions and... But no, honestly, um, we lost last week pretty handedly to Logical Decision. They played really well. Um, I know they're probably happy that they don't have to face us anymore for the rest of the season because I feel like we're just going to be extremely, like we're just gonna be like a lot stronger team. I mean, as you can tell, we had some pretty prom, like I don't say promising, convincing wins, um, but no, pretty much any team in B West I mean, I told my team this in the very beginning of the season. There's not really anyone or any team in this division that I'm remotely worried about or that we have to worry about. So um, as long as, like, you show confidence in your team, then your team kind of buys into it and they believe the same thing. And as you can tell, as long as you stay calm and no matter what, everyone else is. So. All right. Uh, looking looking into the chat first for our first crowdsource question. Uh, your team wants to know how many push-ups you'd be able to do in real life. Um. All right. Well, I'm pretty sure I know who asked that, which is P Moore. Um, P Moore. Actually, I think it's Pyro wants to have a push-up competition with me. But if I get to 50 followers on Twitch, self plugin, Twitch TV, Twitch TV slash Rexpa, I would do push-ups on stream. And then you can see how many there, because I'm not going to tell them the answer, because I know exactly who's asking. And then getting to a more serious note, uh, end game number two, as you were saying, you mentioned uh, as a Valera, what do you look for in your opening uh, when you're trying to open up a team fight? Like, are you looking for the squishiest member to silence, or are you just trying to get that giant ass blind onto the auto attacker? Um, as like as like a completely honest answer completely changes team fight to team fight um in the sense of like i'm not going to open immediately as a valera like i'll probably wait like two or three seconds see what cooldowns are being used in the sense of like let's say sylvanas uses her e to engage or something like that and knowing that she has a second e if you go for the silence on sylvanas then she can't e away then it's a free kill there and then i mean taking the silent or taking the bl extra blind duration at 13 your main target you're looking for is Zuljin, because he's majority of their enemy team's damage. So if all you do is you literally just blind the Zuljin, then he's completely out of the fight for four and a half seconds, and then you can pretty much just go on whoever and not have to worry about the Zuljin. So it would just it just changes from team fight to team fight, see what the situation is. Like the thing with Valir is you can do so many different things. The one thing Arrogant Nephilim did bring in both matches was a ton of map pressure. Uh, how did you as a team adapt to respond to the pressure they were putting? Um, in the second game, I'll say the second game first, just because it's the more like it's the more fresh one. They didn't they didn't really have much map pressure because we had uh, Leoric to be able to double soak to match the double soak on Phoenix. Actually, I think Leoric out double soaks Phoenix. It was just the reason you saw Phoenix sometimes out double soak the Leoric is because we brought Leoric down on like on a couple rotations to make it a 5v4 and wipe the enemy team. So that's the only time you ever saw him out soak the Leo. But in the first game, we knew that they had Zagara and we weren't really worried about it because um, we're just going to play for the objective. I'm not really worried about other teams out macroing us pretty much. Our team fight was a lot stronger. So as long as like 
I mean, Zagara is like a decent pusher, but she's not like someone that's going to, you know, win them the game. And we know that we can just pretty much take any objectives, play aggressive off the objective jumps, and just... Because as long as we get walls and stuff, but like as we cap the objective, then we can just play off that and just kind of snowball the game. The last question for you is any shoutouts you have after your victory today? Yes. I would like to shout out my team. I want to shout out Bridge, Bridge to Nowhere. Like I said, he's the newest member. He's probably the worst player on the team. Um, he's actually single. He's never had a girlfriend before. So if there's any ladies out there, he's actually extremely gorgeous. Uh, shout out Crafty, our tank player. Um, you know, one of these days he'll land a, a Nubarak stun or not get juked with ETC one of these days. We're working on it. Uh, shout out to Nate, our other DPS player. That's my boy. I don't have anything bad to say about him. He's the only person on the team I can trust. I There's P more. Shout out to P more. Uh, he can only play one support. That's Dukov. Um, you know, we're trying to get him on other supports, but if we wanted that, we would just bring on, you know, old gold level player and he'd play better than P more. Uh, shout out to Pyro. He's my little Asian buddy. I love him. Um, if you could see me right now, Pyro, I'm making a heart with my hands. Uh, shout out to Kovi. He's the captain. He's the one that put all of this together. Uh, you know, I don't really have anything bad to say about him either. As much as I want to flame him and flame everyone else, there's not really anything bad I have to say about him. Um, and then I want to give a shout out to you both. Uh, thank you for casting our game as well. I'll definitely be going back and watching the VOD. And uh, so I just, I just can't thank you guys enough for casting as well. We, we as a team really do appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for putting on a show and good luck for the rest of the season, Rexpa. Thank you. And with that, uh, that will be today. Uh, looking to the calendar, tomorrow uh, I will be back with actually a Heroic Division cast at 9.30 of BBW versus Probe 1, so look out for that. Uh, other than that, though, any last words, Monkus, after today's match? I think that everything that uh, needed to be said has been said. Well, thank you so much for co-casting with me today. Uh, oh, I had a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, that'll be it for me tonight. Uh, good luck, have fun, and I will see you in the Nexus.